Hello everyone. It is time for another live stream. I have been absent for the last few weeks and it'll be great to get back on channel and talk with you guys and catch you up on what you have missed. So let's see who tunes in first. And then I'll catch you up. That's assuming YouTube still exists. <laughs> Hi, Michael. How are you? Hey, Brockton. I am back. Hello, Pickle Boy. <laughs> yep. Surprise. Hi, Daniel. Joe, you're here. Hi, Tam. Tam, that'll be short for Tammy. Will garlic work? <laughs> Someone's reading the title already. Smoking Reefers, Nick Walters, Mojave Lorax. Hello, hello, hello. Cliffy Poos. Useless Reefer, you still have to change your name. Hi, Mandy, Kurt, Andrew. Alrighty, so let me start to catch you guys up. <laughs> Aw, am I pulling away from Than's live stream? I'm sorry, I didn't even know. I just set up everything, then I took a shower and got cleaned up for you guys, and boom, we're here for a live stream. So I'm so glad to see you guys here. Uh, we're going to get into our topic in a few minutes, so if you're new to this channel, new to the stream, I do a little thing, and then we go into the topic for about 45 minutes or so, and then we go into question and answer, where you can ask your questions, and I answer them live. And uh, we've been doing that for a long time, and that's why the live streams are so long. They tend to be about two hours, maybe longer, and they usually happen on Saturday, well, almost always on Saturday at 2 p.m. Central Time. So that's kind of the business end of things. Uh, so I wanted to catch you up, so I'm going to start off with something sad. Um, and some of you knew this was coming. Um, so my mother died a few weeks ago. And when that happened, uh, you know, my whole life kind of fell apart. And I knew it was coming. I'd mentioned previously that she was really sick. So I never talked about it publicly on social media because she didn't talk about it publicly. And I was respect respecting her privacy. And so once she died, I felt I could finally start talking about what had happened and what was going on. So I'm going to catch you guys up because a lot of people are asking, you know, how are you okay? Is everything all right? Are you hurting? You know, what? they didn't know what was up. They didn't know if it was my neck or something else or being sick. Or COVID, you know, who knows. But no, what happened was about seven years ago, I guess, my mother got diagnosed with um, lung cancer. And she was very stoic about it. And she said, okay, well, I've had a good life, you know. And both her husband, my stepfather, and myself both were like, no, we want you around. And we um, basically encouraged her to fight it, which she did. She went through the chemo. She fought it all off. She did all the, you know, whatever you do for recovery. And then for six years, she has been cancer-free. And then early this year, she felt something wasn't right. So she went to the doctor. They did their stuff. And uh, they said the cancer is back, and it's all over your body. Um, and ironically, it was not in her lungs. And yet that's what they called it at the time of death. They call it lung cancer, even though there was nothing wrong with her lungs. Uh, matter of fact, this is interesting in case you didn't know it. Always teaching you guys something. Uh, when she uh, had this cancer, they had to do surgery because they cut out the cancer. They removed two-thirds of her right lung. And so she was actually living for the last six years with one lung. And a lot of people may not know that's even possible. I, I know I didn't. I was like, huh? But uh, so she uh, had the one lung and then the top piece of the other one because I guess all the tubes were connected. I don't know how that works. And uh, she did really well. But uh, then this year she was diagnosed and with COVID, it made it impossible to visit her. I couldn't just fly out there on a, on a lark and hang out with her. But I spent a lot of time with her on the phone, on FaceTime. I knew that things were bad. I also knew she was not going to fight at this time, which made it hard. And uh, I, I was doing a lot of prep work mentally, trying to prepare for this to happen because I've never lost a parent. And I was, uh, you know, it was really hard. And we had some really frank conversations. We had some really nice conversations. I did visit her in June, and I drove all the way out there and hung out with her and uh, she was actually doing really well and all the phone calls we did she was always doing really well and I kept thinking you don't seem like someone that's sick and so basically my mother who's awesome was uh, very good at putting on her best face and out of all the phone calls we only had one phone call where I was like oh man you know where she was lying back because she just couldn't sit up and uh, but she would always get up she put on her makeup, you know, she fixed her hair. She wanted to look nice for herself or her husband and if I happened to call. So it was really, really great. So I actually remember her as healthy 
if that makes any kind of sense. I mean, she literally did not let me see the worst. And uh, then basically a month ago, she, um, she basically went to sleep and didn't wake up. And that was how it ended. And so it was really hard, of course, because I knew it was coming and uh, I was calling daily for updates to see what's happening. And then when once that uh, <clears throat> that initial shock wore off, I tried to get back to work and I kept making mistakes. I mean, I, I know I've shipped out a, a couple of items that were not my normal standard and I was disappointed, but at the same time I wanted to get the order out to the customer and I was very annoyed at myself and I was hoping they wouldn't be upset with me. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously it was something that was critical I wouldn't have shipped, but uh, it was these little tiny things that just bugged me. I was like, are you kidding me? And even yesterday I made another mistake. I, I'm having a real hard time with staying completely focused on my work like I normally would be. So I'm working slower. And uh, so orders are going out, they're just going out slower, or they've been delayed because after that happened, a few days later, I guess it was, uh, Macna Phoenix Rising happened, which was a virtual Macna. I think I told all of you, or maybe I only told people on Facebook, but I told everyone, you need to attend it because it's online. It will never be cheaper. You can stay in your pajamas. You can enjoy the education. There was uh, nine speakers, a couple of workshops, some really cool, uh, let's call them hangouts every evening that went till like three in the morning. And so for those three days, I was immersed in Mac, and I kind of took my mind off of what had just happened, which was nice, and it allowed me to smile and interact with others. Uh, it was uh, it was helpful. But then when that was over, now I missed Macna and the people and my mom. And at that point, it was like I'm time. For, it's time for me to get on the road, just do a road trip. So I drove to New York, and uh, on my and so that's why there was no live stream that weekend. You know, so with Macna weekend, I was unavailable, as you guys knew. And then the following weekend, uh, I was on the road driving to New York, which is a long drive. And uh, I stopped at Mark Callahan's house and saw his new thousand gallon aquarium and filmed a little tiny bit to share with you guys. And then I went all the way to Long Island to the Long Island Aquarium and I filmed Joe Waiulo's 20,000 gallon reef for a nice update because I think the last time we filmed it was about four years ago. So I wanted to capture that. Then I drove back and I hung out at a friend's house uh, in Pennsylvania. And then I came back home and uh, I've been trying to get back into the swing of things. So that kind of catches you up on what is going on. And look, I didn't even drag it out. Uh, I don't know how long have we been on here for about seven minutes. Not too bad. So, uh, you know, thank you guys. I mean, a lot of people reached out. You know, everyone kept saying, if there's anything I can do. And I was like, what can you do? I mean, I appreciate the sentiment. And it's like, I should have a list of things you can do, right? But I didn't. I, uh, it just was something you have to deal with. And I'm sure it's going to keep hitting me. You know, I, this week was kind of good. Uh, it didn't really beat me down. Uh, contrary, my stepdad, who's been married to her for plus 20 plus years, uh, it's really hard for him because he's at home alone in the home they shared. And so I call him and uh, we talk and I try to help him cheer up a little bit for a few minutes. It's super hard for him. I'm going to have to drive out there again. So... Um, other than that, uh, let's get into our topic for today, and uh, I want to preface this with I am not a fish disease guy, and I've told you guys that for years, and I had someone ask me ick questions, and I thought, oh, let me talk about ick, but it's not my strength, and I'm going to do my best with this information. Uh, I don't deal with ick in my own tanks. I pretty much never have, and I even had one person that was uh, recently messaging me, and he said, well, what do you do about this? And I said, I don't know. And then I, and I pointed him to Humblefish, because Humblefish is who I consider the expert to go to. You know, there's others, but that's the one I pick. And he said, why won't you just answer my questions? <laughs> and I was like, because I don't have any answers. And he says, don't you have any fish? And I'm like, yes, I do. And he's like, well, and I was like, and they don't have ick. So um, I busted out a couple of books. So this one here I've talked about before. It is unavailable, which is super annoying, because I promoted it on my channel here once, because I thought everyone could buy it by the ebook, and it didn't happen. So this one here, Jay Hemdall, I'll uncover the words, you can see his name, this is the author. He's actually working on a new book. So that is coming, and uh, when that comes out, I will of course let you guys know because, oh, my hand keeps covering the words. Um, this book covers a lot of information. I've read through it once, and uh, I have a section in here marked off to talk about it, and I did some highlighters and stuff. So we'll be going into that. And then I pulled out this book, written by my friend Bob Fenner, who died a few months ago, unfortunately. This is The Conscientious Marine Aquarist. This book is available online. It's available as softcover or hardcover. Uh, the volume two is the latest edition. 
Uh, you can definitely and should buy this, so you should do it. Not to support their family or something because the knowledge in here is so excellent. This book here um, was printed in... First printing was 1998, um, and then it was revised in 2001, and then there's a new version. This I have the not latest version. Uh, Bob even wrote in the, you know, he autographed my book, which, if you can see, yeah, so he autographed it, and he promised me a new copy, and I never made him do it. So I found some information in here as well, and uh, I want to talk about uh, a couple of things I found on the web as well. And then we're going to go into Humblefish, because I told you that is the expert. That is who you go to. Quit asking me about Ick. <laughs> but today we're going to talk about not only Ick, but we're going to talk about what to do when your tank has it, um, and some preventative measures as well that will help you avoid it, hopefully. And there's some really interesting uh, snippets I'm going to read to you from these books, because they said it so well, I don't think I could say it as eloquently. So first of all, Cryptocarin irritans is the Ick we're talking about. That's marine Ick. Uh, marine being saltwater fish. And according to a, a quote from Science Direct, the life cycle of ick is the trophant, which is the feeding and cysted stage enlarges, breaks through the skin, and attaches to substrate, forming the encapsulated dividing tomont. These tomonts undergo mitosis, forming hundreds of daughter tomites. The tomites develop into free living therons, which is the infective stage. Free living, as in they can move about. Therans penetrate the skin and gill epithelium and enlarge, foaming insisted trophons. Therans survive for approximately 48 hours at water temperature of 75 to 79, which is around 24 Celsius. And a single trophant can produce up to a thousand therons. That's the problem. So we, I want to, first of all, read this first little introductory paragraph from Bob that um, I thought made a really good point. So, if you never believed your grandmother's old chestnut about prevention being the best medicine, you're almost guaranteed to appreciate its truth as you gain experience with marine fishes. The best home aquarists do not spend a great deal of time or energy fretting about or coping with disease, for the simple reason they have cut most problems off at the pass. Lackadaisical hobbyists, on the other hand, will find themselves coping with a constellation of symptoms, maladies, and plagues ending up with a medicine chest of remedies and a sad tally of lost specimens. In short, disease is relatively rare in a well-kept marine tank, but it can be a never-ending problem for the uninformed or uncaring hobbyist. So I thought, man, that's such a good... See? I said, I can't say it better. Um, so in this book, this is a, I'm on page 149, chapter 1, under disease, and uh, here's a picture of a fish with a huge... Uh, whatchamacallit, isopod, and the isopod is sucking the blood out of this poor fish. So uh, this would be an excellent book for your collection. This is just one section of the entire volume. So he talked about some of the basics, and he also talked about prevention, preventative baths and dips, and uh, then he talked about quarantine tanks, of course, so we're going to talk about some of that. But there's something else. I thought he had a whole list here that caught my eye. Yeah, okay. So what order should I go in? We're going to tackle this book, and then we're going to tackle the next book. <laughs> and there were some really key points in here as I was reading through it, because like I said, I'm not the fish disease guy, so I was trying to kind of learn a little bit to understand it in a more eloquent way, so I, or in a more... Trying to be more educated is what I'm trying to say. So he talked about some of the things that, you know, we need a basic system. We need a healthy aquarium that's very, very stable. That's key. Temperature should be stable. Salinity should stay the same, rock solid day after day. Um, we want to have a light cycle that is the right duration, and we uh, want to feed healthy foods to our fish. But you keep buying new fish, and that's where everything gets tricky. So I want to talk about um, specifically when he talked about the stresses in the aquarium. And he has 15 different things that stress our fish. So I'm just going to run through them really quick. Improper pH or drastic sudden changes in pH. Every time you guys buffer pH and it shoots up and comes back down and shoots up and comes back down and you keep buffering and buffering, that's a stressor. Improper temperature or sudden changes in temperature. Improper salinity for short or extended periods. Physical trauma such as pounding on the tank or sudden movements that scare tank inhabitants. Aggressive tank mates. Poor diet. High ammonia nitride nitrate or other 
metabolic levels. Um, so for example, he says a high nitrite level pre prevents oxygen from reaching the cells, may cause suffocation or brain damage. That's why we don't put fish through a cycle. Um, and then he's recommending keeping nitrate at less than 30 for fish-only systems and less than 10 for aquariums with invertebrates is the appropriate goal. He also mentions another stressor is other toxins, chlorine, copper, detergents, iron, lead, zinc, commercial ammonia, nicotine, perfume, and colognes, oil, paint fumes, insecticides, including contaminants from dogs and cats, like even their flea collars. Too little or too much carbon dioxide. Too much, too little, or irregular period of light. That was interesting. I was like, huh, like, and I mean, it makes sense. If you're trying to rest, you turn off the lights in the room, right? So he said, too much light, intensity, and duration affects the metabolic, uh, met metabolism of all livestock. Too little light is problematic for photosynthetic invertebrates and algae. So a standard light interval is ideal. Um, and I typically tell you guys, shoot for a nine-hour day. That's what I've been recommending for a long time. Dirty or cloudy water is another stressor. Cloudy water is usually caused by bacteria. The bacteria in the water may even use up the available oxygen and poison your stock with their metabolites. Um, another stressor is no hiding places where the livestock can retreat to feel safe. Then there's infectious or parasitic disease, which is what we're talking about today. Other sudden changes in the environment and finally overcrowding. Those are all stressors that you want to avoid. And then he goes into different things such as the different diseases and we're gonna skip past that. And then he talked about some of the products that were available back in the day that you could use and we're gonna get into that. And then I'm going to show you a close up picture of this fish right here. Let's see, see, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's little tiny white dots. So here's something I never knew as I was reading this. The white dots are not the ick. And according to even Humblefish's website, the, uh, the dots or, um, yeah. yeah, he said on his website, ick is completely invisible to the naked eye. None of us can see any stage of it. So those white dots are where the ick went into their flesh and created a mucus that creates the dot. So the mucus is sort of like, I guess in my head, like a pimple. You know, you know there's something in the skin, but the pimple is what you see. So you're not actually looking at little fleas like white dots. Like I always thought that was what they were, but that is not the case. All right, now we're gonna to go to this book, which like I said, I wish you guys could get. And um, he, I'm just gonna read the cause. So cryptocurrent irritants, better known as saltwater ick or marine white spot disease, is a very common ciliate protozoan that every marine aquarist encounters at some point, and is probably the second most common reason people leave the hobby. The first being unexplained fish loss. Capable of killing fish in 14 to 21 days, C. irritans, which is cryptocarin irritans, causes the needless loss of many aquarium fish each year due to delays in starting treatment and or choosing the wrong medication. Handled properly in a timely manner, ick should never cause fish loss. By the way, that reminds me, there was something else in Bob's thing I wanted to read you guys. <laughs> it was very interesting. So he talked about the handling of the fish before we ever get them. For example, the typical damselfish may pass through as many as seven sets of hands between Fiji and your home aquarium. The collector, buyer, exporter, importer, jobber, retailer, and consumer. Each handles the fish as little as possible, but you can imagine the stress related to netting, shipping, and changes in water quality, typically compounded by no feeding for days or even weeks. So you see, that's a real thing. And people say, well, you know, you don't have a lot of fish disease in your tank, Mark. You're not running hospital tanks. You're not running quarantine. You're not doing all this stuff. I'm not buying a lot of fish. You know, I have had some of these fish for, well, two of them are 16 years old. Um, two of them are at least seven years old. Um, the skunk clones, I guess, are about five years old. I mean, you know, I, I put in all my fish and I'm done. And my, years ago, my father said, it's like you, you just have corals and you grow, I mean, and you decorate the tank with a few fish. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> I, I decorate it with a few fish I like. Uh, a lot of times if we have a lot of fish, it can cause problems. It can cause pollution, which makes the corals not grow. It can uh, be overcrowded. It can be aggressive. So it's best to choose your best choices and limit them. And, you know, less is more in our reef tanks because of the limited water in the filtration, which is something Jay talked about here. 
Um, okay, this is what Jay said. The life cycle takes about six days at tropical temperatures. This could result in one parasite. I was like, what? One parasite becoming 15 million in three weeks. Because not all tomites are successful in finding a host fish, the parasite typically increases at a rate of about 10 times per week. And then he talked about something called propagul, I think I'm saying that right, pressure. So propagul pressure simply refers to the number of tomites present. If the propagul pressure is low, there are relatively few tomites present, and the chances of them landing on a suitable host are very low. Thus, the infection does not reach the exponential growth phase. And then he uh, had a, a thing here that I thought was interesting. It said, although it's not scientifically proven, it appears that fish that have survived a cryptocarin infection develop some resistance and are less likely to develop the disease in the future. But on the other hand, a fish that is in poor overall health or has suffered an environmental stress may have a lower resistance and be more likely to develop the disease. Let's we'll see what my next point was. Ah, here's one. Um, the life cycle under, under symptoms. The life cycle of the parasite is in sync. This is a whole thing where it goes stage, 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 stage. So there's a free floating stage and there is a, uh, where they settle and, uh, and where they split and make more of themselves and then they get back into the water column. And we're gonna talk about that and some of the, the cures, but this is something that I thought was good for a lot of you. It said, um, talked about the parasites being in sync because like I said, there's a specific cycle of four point wheel. That is, they tend to drop off and form tomonts at the same time, giving Aquarius the false hope that the fish have cured themselves, quote unquote, or worse yet, that an incorrect treatment is actually working. Typically four to six days later, many more white spots suddenly reappear on the fish. Then the, parasite begun, be, the parasites begin to become out of sync with one another, and the fish begins to carry the white spots, trophins, continually with their numbers increasing. So the trophins may not even come off the fish. They may stay on the fish instead of going down to the substrate to release the uh, tomats, I think I said right. It's all these words we never use in English. Uh, some of the symptoms, I mean, you already know about the white dots, but it could be rapid breathing, cloudy eye, pale color, tattered fins. Um, they could even create or coalesce into patches of so much white on the fish. And yet they still say, even for an advanced aquarium, sometimes it's hard to identify what we're looking at. And that's why they always say you have to get a gill sample and you have to look at it under a microscope. And so he has a picture of a cell under the microscope. But um, then he talks about some of the solutions that you could use, and copper is probably the number one use that people turn to. And then the second most popular one has been um, hyposalinity, which is less harsh on the fish, but um, it takes a lot longer, and it's very specific. So he said with copper, you would want to use ionic copper at 0.20 milligrams per liter for 14 days, but uh, it's hard for us to get that. And so it said here, hobbyist, and he also mentions that hobbyist copper test kits are difficult to read. So public aquarists use the device, and the public aquarists, you know, like public aquariums, use a device called a spectro, <laughs> spectrophotometer? I think I'm saying that right. Photometer? Uh, that gives a much more accurate test result. But due to we not having access to that equipment, many hobbyists use something called chelated copper cures. They have a wider margin of error and often do not require testing as they are an add at once type of treatment. However, they are a bit slower to cure the fish and may not act quickly enough if the infection is in an advanced state. He also mentioned hyposalinity, and he was saying in here that it doesn't work very well for hobbyists only because the effort involved in keeping your tank at 1.009. If you get your fish into a hospital tank, and then you bring the salinity all the way down to 1.009, you have to keep it at that number every single day for 21 days in a row. And if one day it goes up to 1.010, you have to restart the clock, which means another three week wait. So it's critical you stay at 1.009, which means you have to check your salinity constantly. And I highly recommend you hook up an auto top off to maintain the exact water volume because that way the salinity can't shift on you, just like your aquarium stays at the same number. So that's really important. And then as you're doing your water changes, that salinity has to match because you have to do a daily water change with a hospital tank to keep ammonia off the gills of the fish. 
Uh, also, another thing I did not know. The biggest risk with using hypocelinity treatment is that another protozoan, Euronema, thrives in low salinity water and is much more difficult to treat than cryptocurian. I did not know there was another disease just waiting <laughs> at 1.009. I was just amazed fish can handle it, but you know they can. Um, some hobbyists have used freshwater dips, and Bob mentioned that in his book as well, and he talked about sometimes the fish is in the water for seconds, others are in there for a few minutes. And the main rule of thumb is use RODI water. Uh, you use buffer to get it up to like 8.0, 8.1, 8.2, somewhere around there. Um, an air stone. And then you would put the fish in that fresh water. And then he mentioned uh, raising the temperature. And how people say if you raise the temperature, the ick will go away. It will go through its life cycle quicker. He says this is complete fallacy. That's it. <laughs> Not even going to keep going. He talked about snake oils. And he said, um, there's a lot of products out there on the market, and many of you have probably seen them, where it says ick medications are sold as being reef safe that could be used with invertebrates, either don't work or are actually not very safe for invertebrates. So, um, and then he says, the reason there are so many of these quote-unquote snake oil products on the market is that too many home aquarists will try anything that claims to cure ick without having isolated the fish and invertebrates. So if you have sick fish, you've got to remove them from the aquarium and treat them. He also goes into UV sterilizers, because a lot of people say, well, if you use UV, it's going to kill the ones that are free-floating. But they have to pass through the UV. And if some are sticking to the fish and not hopping off, they're on the fish continually. And as they release more, if any of that goes through the UV, that's great. But the ones that never went through the UV are still swimming around looking for your fish again. That's why it seems to keep coming back. So he said the reason the UV sterilizer may not work, because it's only effective on the tomite stage, he says the fallacy here is that tomites must leave the fish, but actually some of them get caught in the fish's mucus and stay attached until they become infective trophins again. That means the UV sterilizer will not eliminate active cryptocarin infections from a single aquarium. Where it does have benefit is in eliminating tomites, tomites as they pass through a filtration system from one discrete tank to another, like a public aquarium or a fisheries lab. And then finally, uh, you know, feed your fish, keep the water really stable. That's another uh, technique that people like to use to supposedly get rid of it. It says here, some aquarists feel that if they give their fish the very best environment, their disease resistance will be increased so they won't be infected by ick. The problem with this idea is that it's not the water quality that makes ick such a scourge in aquarium. It's the relatively small volume of aquariums that allows the tomites to locate a host so easily. So it's a small tank, they're not swimming for miles to find a fish. Those fish are right there in that tiny body of water. They just have to go to the left, to the right, boom, they're on a fish. So knowing all this, it's best to just develop a good plan of how you will handle cryptocurrin when, not if, it rears its ugly head in your aquarium. So that's the end of that one. So now, what is the, oh, and then finally, I want to show you guys this. So we'll jump to this window right here. Oh, no, not that window. Let me get this up here on the screen. No, nope, that one either. <laughs> there we go. So finally, I want to show you this. And I don't think I need to be here, but maybe I can squish it over. So this is Humblefish's website. And uh, it's good. see, Humblefish. And it's humble.fish. I mean, how hard is that to remember? Humble.fish. And then on the right, on the left column, you'll have your choices of what you uh, can select. And then there's fish diseases. And there's treatments in here as well. So what I did was I pulled up Marine Ick. So here he has some pictures of what the ick looks like. He talks about some of the things that uh, would give you information. He shows you some examples of fish with the little mucus uh, sacs on their body. And uh, goes into the stages. Uh, there's the picture that shows the cycle I was talking about, where it goes through on the fish, down into the substrate, back up to the fish again. <laughs> and he talks about the, how long things take. And then he mentioned this, which I did not know. He says, now free swimming therons seek out fish to feed on, thereby becoming trophins. And the cycle starts all over again. A given strain will die out after a hundred generations or so. Given the average life cycle of ick is two weeks, this could take up to four years to get rid of. So that's why we can't just hope it'll just go away. Um, and then he has the whole treating. And he goes into this and he emphasizes quarantine. And I want to show you the, uh, the common myths. I thought that interesting was... So here, ick is unavoidable. It exists in every single tank. He says false. You can see ick on fish. And he said in all caps, sometimes. All spots are ick. 
false. And you can read all this on your own. I'm going to put the link in this video's description. Um, certain fish are ick magnets. True. And I'll say this one because it happens to all of us. Tangs have a thin mucus coating protecting their skin, making them more vulnerable to parasites. Conversely, such fishes as wrasses, clownfish, and dragonets, which would be the mandarin, have a thick mucus layer which affords them greater protection. Cleaner wrasses will, and shrimp will eat fish, or <laughs> will eat ick. False. Ick will go away on its own. Mostly false. Are there, there are reef-safe medications that will kill ick. False. You can beat ick by running UV. Sometimes. Feeding heavily. Using garlic. These are all techniques we've used to keep fish fat and happy to help them resist. And certain fish are immune to ick. Somewhat true. Like, we kind of say that about Mandarin specifically, and he might mention another one here. Um, it can survive almost indefinitely without seeing any body spots or just a spot or two because it often resides in the gills. And he said, true. All fish have ick. False. Once a fish has ick, he will always have it. False. Uh, if ick can't always be detected, why bother to quarantine? In the confines of a small aquarium, symptoms of ick will almost always manifest themselves. Even if you don't see white dots, behavioral symptoms such as scratching, flashing, head twitching, heavy breathing should be present. Prophylactic treatment is a wise course of action, even if it, ick is just suspected. Alrighty. So, uh, I think this right here, and like I said, I'm going to put links to all three of the things I talked about, and I'll even link to those books. Well, book. Can't get the other one. Grr, I'm so mad about that. So let's talk about what I do when it comes to fish. Anytime I buy a new fish, and I have bought new fish, okay, it does happen. I bought the cleaner wrasse, so I guess it, mm, almost a year ago. I put it through Safety Stop. So Safety Stop is a product that came out in 2011 by Blue Life USA. The minute it came out, I was so elated. I could not believe we finally had something for everyone that does not quarantine their fish. Because let's be honest, most of you don't. Um, and I had a quarantine tank set up forever. And when I built a 400 gallon and I redid the room, I never made a quarantine tank. But this came out and I've been using it for years. Now this is not the cure or the removal of ick tool that you might be hoping for. But what it does is it knocks off the external parasites. The green stuff is formalin. The blue stuff is malachite blue. It's a two-part bath. You need a bucket. I bought this one at Lowe's. It's a two-gallon bucket. You're going to fill it up with one gallon of aquarium water. You're going to cut open part A, which is the formalin, and you're going to pour that into the one gallon, stir it. It'll be very light green. Then you put an air stone in there, and I recommend a tiny heater. Petco sells these little tiny heaters that looks like a lipstick case with a, a wire coming off. You can't adjust the thermometer on it. I mean, it's just plug and go, but it keeps the water around 75 the whole time. So the water won't cool off, especially as we're in the winter months. Um, and if you want, you can put like a towel or some kind of rubber pad under this bucket. So if it's not sitting on concrete or a tile floor and cooling, you know, a little bit of insulation under the bucket, that little heater, uh, an air stone, and you put your fish in this for 45 minutes in the formalin and tank water. And after 45 minutes, you take a second bucket. I didn't bring two buckets over. Just imagine this is empty. I got another bucket. I take another gallon now. I don't do this in the beginning. I make, I do the acclimation. Once it's acclimated, I drain a gallon into the bucket. I put in the green stuff. I do everything I said. And then I set the timer for 45 minutes. And of course, I observe the fish. And if everything looks normal, it's just swimming around. It's not freaking out. It's not erratic, which never happens. Um, then after 45 minutes, I take a second bucket. I get another gallon of water out of my tank and I fill up the bucket halfway and I put in the blue part, which is the methylene blue. And that water will be very, very blue. And methylene blue is a great tool against ick. <laughs> and uh, you put in the air stone, but methylene blue actually adds air to the water. So air stone's not critical, but I always do it. It's just a habit. And I move the heater over. And then the fish goes through that for 45 minutes. And now it's ready to go into, ideally, a quarantine tank. But if you're not gonna do that, the next thing I would recommend is a peacemaker, which is the acrylic box I sell. So I do sell this on my website. These are $5 a packet. They're good for several hours. You can put many fish through it over a five hour period. You know, if, let's say you had a bunch of different fish. You, if you have big fish, you can use multiple packages and a bigger bucket with more water volume. So like if you had a five gallon bucket and you're gonna put three gallons of tank water, use three packets and you would make the three gallon solution, put the big fish in there and make them go through the bath. Um, it says specifically on here, do not put an ick infested fish like you see it covered in this and expect some miracle. I think it'll kill your fish. I mean, I've never asked, but it says it, so I just believe that must be true. I wouldn't try that. But, you know, if you just got some new fish on the fish store and you have no idea of their health, putting them through this is 
the least you could do, other than just put the fish in your tank and hope it all works out, which is crazy, and I don't recommend that. Uh, what I would love for you guys to do, I really do think you should have a quarantine tank. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not setting you the best example, but I've found that safety stop works great for me, and that's why I've used it, and I buy fish so sporadically. But um, if you set up a quarantine tank, and you buy your brand new fish, and you acclimate it, I would put it through safety stop, okay? That's what I would push. And that basically means when you get the fish in the door of your home, it's going to be about two hours till you get it into the quarantine tank. And now that's in that tank, which is just a simple tank, like a 10-gallon or a 20-gallon, with a hang-on hang -on back filter, thermometer, um, ammonia guard. Um, Top-off would be nice. <laughs> uh, and then you, of course, have to do water changes. And you, But every time you feed that fish, there's no competition. The new fish is by itself in that tank, or maybe there's two or three fish you bought that day. They are together in that tank, but it's not your reef full of hungry guys that are used to gobbling up all the food in the first minute, right? So you can have them in that quarantine tank for a couple of weeks just to observe. We're not even talking about medicine. Just observing it. And if the fish looks completely healthy after 14, 21 days, you'll feel, you should feel much more comfortable to move it into your tank. Now, the reason this whole topic even came up is I got a message from someone on Facebook asking me about ick and how they were dealing with it and what to do and, and that they were scared to buy tangs uh, because they just didn't want to take a chance. And so this is the other part of the story. If your tank already has had ick in it or seems to have ick present, every time you add new fish, it doesn't even matter. You're not going to get more ick, so to speak. If the ick's there, the ick is there. It's going to hit your fish. So what your the best case scenario is to remove all the fish from your aquarium and leave it fallow. Fallow means fishless. And you're going to leave it fishless for uh, humble fish is 72 days. For some reason, my brain said 60 days, but you know, the longer the better. You could even go 90 days. But you have no fish in your aquarium for the full period, let's say 72 days, What's, or 76. There's nothing wrong with that. Go with that full period, just set a mark on the calendar or a reminder on your phone. No fish the whole time. You still feed the tank a few times a week to feed the corals, feed the invertebrates, feed the bacteria. But uh, it's fishless, and that way, if there's any kind of ick present in the house, or in, the, in the tank, in their house, then it will die off because it has no host. It can't feed on it, and it will die away. So now the aquarium, the reef tank, is ick free. All the fish that you took out, you should have put through something, whether it's the copper or the hypocelinity. With you having to wait 76 days, that gives you months to get them ick free. So now you know all those fish you own are completely healthy, and when you put them in the tank, they're ick free. And then every new fish you buy should go through the safety stop and the quarantine for observation. And if anything breaks out in the quarantine tank, you can deal with it, but your whole reef is still safe. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to take the chance. I used to, this is kind of, I don't know, in this world everyone gets offended by everything right now, but I used to say this, and uh, you know, it's just how I felt. I said, I don't want to put AIDS in my tank. You know, I didn't want to take a chance with something new. Everything was healthy, and so I would not risk it with something new that could possibly bring in a disease. And uh, I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just explaining how I, how I think. So I, I want to be very cautious, and when I buy something new, I study it really hard at the fish store. Um, and then I do the safety stop. And then I go from safety stop to the peacemaker. So why is the peacemaker so important? A brand new fish like Bob's book said, went through seven hands till you finally got it, right? It's super stressed. It's barely eaten. Um, God knows what it's picked up on the way at any of those stops before it got to your house, right? It could have picked up three different diseases. It could have picked up none. We don't know. But uh, now you've got this, let's call it emaciated, or at least at the most very hungry fish that may or may not have something going on with it. And you just handled it. You acclimated it. You used a net. The fish store used a net. It's super stressed. And that stress hormone, they're releasing into the water column. So when you put that brand new fish in your tank and all the fish go after it instantly, you're like, why? What the heck? You know, they're supposed to get along. I read the compatibility chart. There's, it's the stress her hormone is telling all the other fish, attack. So by putting the brand new fish through safety stop, and then I put it into the peacemaker, which is this acrylic box that hangs in my aquarium right here, that's got a bunch of holes so the water flows through, but no one can touch the fish. Even if they release that hormone into the water and the other fish sense it or smell it or however that works, they can't attack that fish. It's completely safe in its acrylic box. And I leave it in there for three days. And each day I put food in the tank and inside the box. There's a hole in the lid and I squirt it in so the fish can eat. And I might even feed that fish multiple times a day 
to make sure it's getting, you know, beefing up its internals uh, before I release it. And after the three days, any stress hormone it had should have dissipated. And then at this point, you can just take the, I take the peacemaker and I just pour the fish right into the reef and it swims in and I see no aggression. Uh, so that has been my method. So number one, I removed the potential for external parasites. And number two, I, uh, I allow time to get rid of the stress hormone so that the uh, reef doesn't care that somebody new is coming to the water. And then I also like, you know, this is me assigning them human feelings. I feel like if they see each other for a few days, like, all right, he's okay. We'll let him in. You know, it's kind of a politeness thing versus some new fish shows up and wants to live in that exact hole that some other fish sleeps in every single night, for example. That would cause territorial disputes. So we want to avoid the territorial issues and we want to avoid... Um, triggering aggressive responses. Uh, I know some people like to turn off the lights on the tank or they add the fish after dark. You know, there's all these tricks we do. But the bottom line is we're trying to keep the disease out of our aquarium. And so that's why I wanted to kind of get into this one, even though I don't have, I have barely any personal experience with dealing with ick itself. So I, I hope that helped you. I hope that you uh, took away some information here. And I do recommend doing a lot more reading, be less impulsive. <laughs> Highly recommend the quarantine tank, especially if you're new. Um, you know, I, yeah, I've been in this hobby since uh, 97, so 23 years. And with all that experience, you know, experience that I've gained over the years, some of the stuff is just kind of like comes to me naturally. And I just don't run into the problems that maybe someone brand new does. Maybe they just don't see the warning signs. I don't know. But uh, I do want to emphasize that best practices would be safety stop, then quarantine. And also, before someone says it, you know, like, you didn't mention... What about the internal parasites? I got nothing. <laughs> I am not a fish disease person, but the publications I'm pointing you to will go into that. Google is your friend. You can dig up all the information off humble.fish's website. Humble.fish, that's it. It's not .com or anything. Just humble, period, fish, enter. And uh, he's got a bunch of stuff there that'll help you. He is in Club Milo's Reef, which is our group on Facebook. I should stick this on the screen for you. So facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. This group's been around for two years. We have over 8,000 members. Um, when people want to share their tanks or share their stories or share the things they just 3D printed, uh, they do it in there. It's great. Uh, if they want to ask questions, that's what the group is for. If they want my attention, they tag me in it. They either tag Mark Levinson or they tag Milo's Reef. And that way it will bring it to my attention. And sometimes the moderators will tag me if you can't figure out how to tag me. But uh, it allows me to you know, check out what I'm missing. And because uh, there's a lot of comments and I can't keep up with them all because I'm trying to work. So that is kind of the latest information and uh, that I've got for you on this topic. I think that's it. So I hope that, uh, yeah, I already said that. I hope you liked it. <laughs> I hope you found it helpful. So why don't we jump into some questions? Now, whenever you ask a question, uh, Please do add me as Reef so I can spot them because there's a lot of comments in the chat box. And also, I will remove this from the screen and I will pop this on the screen. So if you can purchase things from Mila's Reef, it allows me and Spock, my Nassau Tang, to eat. And I appreciate the business you guys throw me. I realize you have a lot of options out there on the web and there's places where you can get stuff shipped to you overnight. And I know there's places where you... Uh, I don't know, no sales tax, whatever it is that, that saves you money and you guys still choose to shop for Mila's Reef, I really appreciate it. This is my only form of income, not YouTube. My only form of income is that business. And so I promote it online through social media. So I use Instagram and I use Facebook and uh, of course my website itself, which is loaded with information. So if you ever have questions, you go to the website, you go to the search box, you type in what you're looking for, it'll find any blog, article, critter ID, whatever it is that you've asked about and it'll find you whatever it is inside there. The search engine is great on my website and gives you plenty to read, lots of eye candy, I love pictures. And uh, the new version of the website is still in production, but I feel like it's gonna happen maybe uh, later this month. So we'll see what happens uh, when it comes out. I hope you guys like the new look. It should be even nicer. One of the biggest things about the website in the first place was that it had to become mobile friendly because now uh, officially over 50% of people going to the website are on a cell phone or a tablet rather than a desktop computer. Do you guys even know what a desktop computer <laughs> is? So we, um, we need to make sure that the technology works. 
Um, I'm hoping to add some cool uh, payment features. You know, PayPal is my portal. That doesn't mean you have to log into PayPal. You, uh, you just do your thing and you pay with credit card, debit card, gift card, or PayPal. And uh, it handles the transactions. I just have one thing that handles it. But I'm looking into adding Apple Pay, Google Pay. I mean, if I can do things that make it easier for you, um, the checkout process, I'll do it. Uh, just a matter of does it work <laughs> so that and then finally shipping i want to talk about shipping because this this offends people all the time the website always charges a lot in shipping it charges you fedex ground and the fedex rate is really high it, it went up with covid and it's been pretty vicious so a lot of packages that you guys order something really small like for example this does not know need to go in a box that costs 18 dollars to ship so i will put it in something smaller like a padded envelope and send it for a few dollars and refund you the difference in shipping I am not trying to take advantage of any anyone with shipping, and you know, pretty, seems like almost every order that goes out there's a refund. So um, you know, if it's a bigger item like an RODI system or a sump or a top-off container, yeah, shipping is shipping, and it won't budge an inch. But uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you guys are buying that um, I can reduce the price, and I don't know how much you know. I don't know the number that the website's collected because I did all these refunds, but I can tell you I've paid over $10,000 in shipping this year. $10,000! I was like, what? So, that's a lot. All right, let me go to some questions. Well, I'm going to start off with this. Thank you very much for the super chat. And Norlinger, did I say that right? <laughs> I appreciate that. That was very nice. And Mark says, are you growing the beard and prep for Christmas? <laughs> Trying something new. Uh, all I care about is if I still look 39. And that's an ongoing joke, too. Uh, someone said, did I wake up to Halloween? Yeah, I've already got decorations up. It's nice. There's a thing back here that might come into focus when I stand back further. I don't know. But uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, all right, let's try this one. I don't know. I don't even know what my thoughts are yet. Let me just read it out loud. What is your opinion on fish YouTubers, channels that constantly impulse by fresh saltwater fish, reptiles, mammals, etc., only for views? Two channels, for example, or are these two I've never heard of? Um, my opinion on channels that are trying to promote um, a, like they buy something because they want you to click on it, like, oh my god, I've never seen that reptile before, and so you click it to watch the video and they just got it, and they'll even t say things, I mean, maybe... Maybe they'll say things like, I don't even know how, what this thing needs. i got to go to this other store to buy something. I'm going to ask them what I need. I mean, a lot of it's for dramatic effect. You know, I mean, think about it. You know, they're making a movie. <laughs> they're making a TikTok. They're making, you know, an Instagram movie, whatever those things are called. And uh, for me, it's always been about education. My whole website is about education. And yes, I sell things. But initially, when you went to the website, you couldn't even find the things I sold. It was so well hidden. And, you know, I'd link people directly to what they were trying to buy. But my closest friend says, Mark, this is what you do for a living. It has to be on the front page. You have to tell people to buy things. I'm like, oh, I hate it. So anyway, I'm always about education more than spending money. And even when people reach out to me and ask me questions, I will ask them questions back. Like, have you considered this, this, and this before you spend a dollar? So I don't feel like throwing money at everything is the right solution. Now, back to your question about shock value YouTube channels. That's not good. Uh, I don't like that. And I always, I mean, sometimes we do get something impulsively. Sometimes it just happens, it's an, or it's an opportunity, and you haven't seen such and such in so long, you've been really wanted one, and you've always thought about it, and you've done some research, you know, six years ago, and you don't remember what you learned, but you're thinking, oh, man, I've always wanted, let's just say, coral beauty. I don't know, I'm just picking a random fish. And you're like, I want to get one. I think I remember that one's okay in a reef tank. And so you end up buying it, and you come home, and then you go to Club Miller's Reef. What does a coral beauty need? I bought this today. It's not the best approach, and we do want you to read and use Google and uh, get some information in your head. But uh, no, I don't think a channel should be about buying something to get views. And just like, you know, I'm pretty picky about, about how people use social media. Uh, like, for example, when people come onto my YouTube channel, 
and they have supposedly watched a video, which I don't know that they actually watch, then they'll put a comment, hey, check out my channel. That bothers me. I didn't go to their channel and put a link to my channel in their comments. That's a personal pet peeve of mine. I'm sure 90% of you think, who cares? But it's just, it bugs me. It's like, you know, go promote yourself on your own social media. I, that's what I did. How do you think I grew my channel? I went out into the world and told people about it and asked them to tune in. But I didn't go onto other people's channels and other people's pages and tell them. I, I always kept it within my own circle. My circle has just grown organically. And now we're 62,000 strong here on YouTube. It's pretty cool. Now, um, if the person, I want to go back to that question. If the person buys some livestock and then they continue to do videos about that livestock and you get to, you hear it get named, they show you the habitat, they show it how it molted or how it's growing or, or how the, they decorated the habitat and it becomes a family member of the channel, I have no problem with that because now they've, you know, they've adopted it. But if they are getting this and the next week they get something totally different and then three weeks from now they drain the tank or five weeks from now, the tank crashed again. You know, that kind of stuff. Oof, not a fan of any of that. Let's see. Martin Jackson says, My rock work is covered in tiny clear bubbles. They don't have an oily look like bubble algae. Any ideas? What you can do in a situation like that, it might be because it's new rock work, you can take a turkey baster and you can blow off the rock to knock the bubbles off. It uh, could be that you have a power head that is occasionally uh, cavitating or maybe sucking air from the surface and then blowing the bubbles and the bubbles are sticking to the rock. And that's okay. That's not harmful. It's not going to make bubble algae if you're worried about that. It's just something that the tank does usually in the early months, but you shouldn't see it long term. And like I said, you can knock it off. You can fan your hand back and forth. You can take a tiny toothbrush to a spot. You can take a power head, which is my favorite approach, especially with a bigger aquarium, and plug it to an extension cord. And you can just walk around your tank and just blow everything off and it'll also kick off the detritus and keep the rock nice and clean and knock those bubble loose bubbles loose and if you have to do that a few times a week initially or once or twice a week for the first few weeks you know that's fine it's, it's not like it's a thing you'll be doing for the rest of your life so it's just a weird temporary thing that happens uh, Lynn says is a powder blue tang a fish that can survive a long time if your tank is healthy or do they all die of ick uh, I had a powder blue that was super healthy that would break out an ick and then, I mean, literally, it just looked like snow. <laughs> and then, you know, two days later, completely perfect, not a thing on it. And then, you know, fast forward, I don't know, six weeks and that day, <clears throat> and then, you know, like I said, a day or two later, not a, not a dot on the body, just looks picture of health. And then I don't see it again for months. And then I do something wrong in the tank and it causes stress and like a puffer fish. It's the most insane thing. Uh, I never had to treat that powder blue, and I had it for five years. The reason I lost that fish was not due to ick. I told this story in the past where I made a mistake and turned off all my pumps and went to bed, and uh, I killed half the fish in my tank being an idiot. I was really mad at myself. I never, I did not make that mistake twice, but uh, I lost that very healthy powder blue, and I was very sad about it. But there was a silver lining, which is kind of a weird thing to say. When the powder blue no longer existed in my reef tank, my toadstool leather that always looked smooth like leather grew all these stalks with little flowers that polyps came out and they would move like a, a sea of like a, a field of wheat. And it was gorgeous. And I was like, man, I'm, I feel bad about the powder blue, but wow, this coral looks amazing. And I was really happy about that. So uh, it was kind of a trade off. Rose says, I need to buy reverse osmosis systems. You only need one. And I do sell them on my website. Uh, DDOT says, I treated all my fish and let my tank go fishless for a long time. That's vague, but okay. Got a tank from a buddy that was in copper for three weeks. After a week in my tank, it was covered in ick. It's not getting along with others. Yeah, you're, you've got a mess on your hands. Um, really, you're going to, unfortunately, you need to go back to the whole fallow thing and restart the clock. And you're going to have to leave that tank without fish for 76 days or, say, 90, and treat the fish and get them all of them healthy. You may even need to put a divider between that new fish you got that is acting up 
so that there's no fighting in the quarantine or the you know, hospital tank. Unfortunately, that's the downside. <laughs> I could put this on the screen because it's funny. I hope everything's okay. I missed the last two weeks not watching it. Had to actually speak to my wife. <laughs> that is great. Uh, Arlo asked, what is the link? Humble fish document. Humble.fish. Enter in your browser. It's all you got to do, and then you'll find everything. Uh, Nick Walter says, I am in the process of setting up a new tank. It has three holes, so I wanted to use the bee and animal uh, drain system, but I have no experience with this type of overflow. Any tips you could offer? You should be able to look up bee and animal overflow, and there's a whole website that is very wordy that explains every nuance of how you set that up. But you can have a full siphon drain, you're going to have a Durso drain, you're going to have an emergency drain that no water should be coming out. And then once the other, if the others fail, the emergency takes over. And actually, mine is sort of that style. Mine's actually, a, what did I call this? I think mine's a double Herbie. <laughs> so there's a Herbie drain system as well. But Be an Animal is a natural website. You should be able to find that. And if you can't find it, um, the Wayback Machine will find it. Uh, Mark Waller says, what is your opinion about light shock? I've been watching Mark Callahan's videos where he's talking about not having your tank in a room where you'll be turning the lights on at night. That's an interesting thought, and I kind of actually handle that with my own tank. I like to have the lights on, and then when the lights are off, basically I like to have the room dark. And, uh, you know, the TV will put some light in the room, and finally the TV turns off and the room is dark. But uh, sometimes you have to turn on the lights. And it would be nice if you could turn them on at a low setting so you don't just, like, scare a fish right into a, the tentacles of an anemone, for example. So that's something to keep in mind. But uh, hopefully you won't have fish that are so skittish that the light coming on suddenly makes them, you know, drop dead to the bottom of the tank. Josh says, what is the best attack for bryopsis? Uh, <laughs> and he gives me a compliment. Uh, I would say that um, uh, Flux RX is probably going to be your best bet. It's a product, I'm trying to think what the medicine is. I'm somehow put it in the chat, but I sell it in three different sizes. So you've got it for the smaller tanks, the bigger tank, and then tank my size. And uh, it's a treatment that's about 21 days, and it will just make it all die off. There are other methods that are very manual, hands on, and uh, it involves, you know, uh, pulling off as much as you can, adding lettuce nudibranchs squirting magnesium on it, trying to drip peroxide on things. I mean, it's a whole ordeal. But the Flux RX seems to be uh, a real hit. And then a lot of people swear by Vibrant. But I don't know that Vibrant is a bryopsis killer, but Flux RX definitely is. So I would point you to that. Um, Don says, does a bubble tip anemone know the overall size of the tank it is in? I have five of them at the same time, or the same type, and two are smaller than the that are smaller than the other two in the main tank. Um, I don't think they, they sense a size of aquarium necessarily. And I have seen, like for example, I was running a temporary 215 gallon reef tank in my fish room when the 400 leaked. And I had this giant rose anemone. And it was amazing. <laughs> it was so big and I kept thinking, wow, is it ever gonna split? And it was super crazy tall. And I just happened up the pumps off. I think I was feeding sun corals. And it just looked like fireworks raining down. It was the most beautiful. And so I took a picture. And it wasn't three days later. It ripped itself in half. So I don't think they know their tank size. And I don't, you know, just because you have tanks all tied to the same system, I, that doesn't have any bearing. It, it all comes down to lighting and flow, it, how they react in your tank. I've seen, I've visited some hobbyists where they have the bubble tip, like, tight down in the rock work and beautiful bubbles. I have a picture of that in my hallway here. And then I have others like mine. They're just tentacles flowing around everywhere like a long tentacle anemone but no I don't think they know their tank size uh, reef and dive says how do you feel about reef medications like polyglab medic I haven't used it I, I learned about it and immediately forgot what I learned so I don't have any opinion on it at all oh nice reef trace live just chimed in he says the new Miller's reef website should enter quality check in the next, uh, with all features next week. And we will share all 
via Reef Trace app, and the new site is expected to go live. Yeah, because Reef Trace is a partner of mine, and or I'm a partner of his, I don't know. And uh, we the things are intermingled, and he is you know he's been doing this app for a while, and I hired him years ago to do Miller's Reef, and then this year in January I said start the new version because I know you're going to tell me something is becoming. Uh, what do they call it? Not defunct, but like certain software will suddenly stop. There's no more support. And I said, just get me to the next version. <laughs> so we started the whole ordeal all over again. I, man, it's so much work to rebuild the site. And uh, I'm so grateful that I can turn to him and not have to do it myself. Uh, Cuballs Reef says, I'm upgrading from a 72 to 180. Congratulations. You're going to love that. Uh, dry rock, dry sand with some old tank rock to help seed it. I'm worried about livestock transfer. Can you give me some pointers? <laughs> um, have a lot of salt water on hand. You know, like, I know you're setting up 180, so you need 180, right? But have another 50, 60, 80 gallons of water on hand while you're doing everything. Ideally, it would be really cool if you could somehow tie the two tanks together temporarily with, like, a common sump to where it's all the same water. And that way you can literally pull the livestock out of this tank and you can put it in that one because it's the exact same water. And then, of course, you'll probably, because you're breaking down the old tank, you're going to take the lights off to get them out of your way. And maybe you're going to use those lights on the new tank. So you won't have to worry about changes in spectrum necessarily, but your 72 is a certain height and your 180 is probably a little taller. So you probably will have to make some adjustments there. Plus, your rock work may be lower this time, so your corals are further away from the lights. So keep that in mind. But doing a tank transfer is very much like doing a, a one-day setup. Plan on it taking all day long. This will not be a few hours. This will be an all-day ordeal. If you have a spouse, they need to be doing something because they're going to get very impatient with how you're not done yet. So, I mean, if they want to help you, that's great. But you should let them know, this is going to take all freaking day. I'm not even going to bed till I'm done. And as long as they hear that in advance, they can kind of mentally prep for this horror that you can put them through. Having things handy like tons of towels, shop vacs, make sure your electrical is set up for the new tank so it can support it. Uh, I would recommend at least two circuits going to the 180, maybe three, so that we can divide your gear across multiple circuits of one trips, the others still keep going. That would be a thought. But uh, the biggest thing is getting all the water the same. And if you can't get all the water the same, then um, I would do something where you're pumping water out of one tank into the other, and then some, sending it down to the sump and basically mixing it to where when you're finally done, it all matches. And if you're not willing to do that or if it's impossible to do it because you have to remove one tank and get out of the way, then your new salt water needs to match your old salt water. So your temperature, your pH, or let's just say alkalinity, okay? Your temperature, your alkalinity, your salinity must match. If those three match, you can pretty much safely move everything over. Uh, the rock that you're going to move from the old tank to the new tank to help seed that uh, dry rock, the old rock may have sponge on it. So I would highly recommend when you drain some water out of the old tank into, let's say, a trash can, and you take the rock out and you put it into that trash can, put in that trash can and shake the heck out of it to get all the detritus out. And then if you see sponge, submerge it immediately. And that way when you, again, shake it off really good before you put it in the new tank, if the sponge is exposed to air for a duration, which could be as little as 15 minutes, it could start dying. And then you put this nice, pretty rock out of your old tank into the new system. With dying sponge, you're actually adding ammonia to the water. We don't want that to happen. So I'm a big fan of keep your live rock submerged underwater 99% of the time. And then you go ahead and send it into the, uh, the new system for seed. I hope that helps. I'm saving that. All right. Let's see. Let me have a drink. Um, Yashiv asks a very specific question that requires me to do some quick conversions. So let me open up the calculator. Then I'll continue. 62 by 20 by 20. Okay, so it's not a big tank. Matter of fact, if 
by 231. Okay, Yoshiv, <clears throat> I had to convert it to American for me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not European. Um, so he said he's setting up a 450 liter si system that the dimensions are 1600 instead of 1 1.6 meters. It's 1 1.6 meters by a half a meter by a half a meter. And uh, using millimeters drives me crazy. Um, it's a 107 gallon aquarium. He was saying, would it be worth having closed loops? No, I don't think so. I believe not. Uh, we have these really nice pumps like the Gyre, the Vortec, um, and there's other brands out there. Oh, the, the Nero. I really like the Nero pumps. And you could definitely put a Nero 5 or two of them and have a lot of flow in the tank with a little small footprint the size of a hockey puck. And uh, you'll be very happy. With 107 gallons, that's not a big tank. That was 62 inches by 20 by 20. And uh, my frag system is 48 by 18 by 16. That's almost what yours is. And I have one Nero 5 blowing water across. If you had one at each end, you'd be set. If you want to use gyres, you can. The gyre just looks longer. It's a bigger s stream. And I feel, unless things have changed, they're harder to clean compared to the Nero. So if you want to get the Nero, I would recommend that. But maybe gyres are what's available in your country. So, uh, but the closed loop thing is you have to drill holes in the tank, which if you're comfortable with, you can. And then you're going to have a lot of pipes. you got pipes going out. you got pipes coming in. Plus, you have the drains going down to the sump, which is more pipes. You have the plumbing coming up, which has more pipes. So I would think the bigger a tank, the more likely for closed loops. I have a client right now with a huge 2,000-gallon aquarium. It's got four closed loops. And the plumber working on it said, oh, there's no room for all these pipes. So um, keep that in mind. You know, It depends how, how much you're into doing plumbing. But uh, I would, for me, I think the trade, I mean, think about this. The closed loop has all these holes. Each one is a potential that can leak with pipes going down to a pump that could leak. These are potentials. I mean, they're not going to, but they could. Uh, also, when the pump fails, you have to remove it. So you have to have valves you can close, which is adding to the cost of doing the plumbing. Um, you'll have to have unions to disconnect that pump. You might need to have, well, you definitely should have an extra one of that pump for maintenance purposes. So you can swap it out with a new one that's clean. There's just a lot involved in all that, where if you can just take the Nero and put it on the glass with a magnet, and you put one on the other side of the magnet, you're done. It, you just open your app and you say how fast. And you're, you can even have feed mode, and you can have different cycles. You can pick wave mode, you can pick uh, constant, you can uh, pick surge, and they're not expensive. Because once you take the price of your pump, or let's say two pumps, and you take the price of the plumbing, and the valves, and the unions, and the bulkheads, and the drilling of the tank, you might find that mathematically that that didn't really help you with a bigger tank it would but not with someone your size and good luck with your new tank uh, Heron says if setting up a quarantine tank it needs to be 12 feet away from the display tank according to Humblefish thank you for saying that I didn't see that to prevent aerosol transfer of disease I have mine in a separate room that makes sense and you know, a lot of people like to put the quarantine tank in the kitchen. <laughs> and I know you're like, why? That's weird. But it's because there's it's usually a small tank that fits on the end of the kitchen counter. And you can kind of see your new fish while you're making dinner or, or eating a bowl of cereal or whatever you're doing. And just make sure they're okay. A lot of times the aquarium, like mine behind me, is against the wall. And there's nowhere to put this quarantine. So it does end up in a different room or on a countertop or on a an end table or something. But that's interesting about the 12 feet. I mean, it makes sense. And then, of course, the other part, I mean, if you're really being cautious, you want to make sure that your all your implements that you use on the quarantine tank never get used on the main tank. That includes nets, thermometers, refractometer. Um, you know, everything has to be isolated. So it seems like you have to buy two of everything. So people are like, oh, I don't want to do all that. Now, of course, you can go through a lot of processes to really sterilize and clean things, but you need to stay on top of it. And it's so easy to just grab something, even if it's like a sponge and you grab the wrong sponge like you need if you let's I would say a quarantine tank needs a blue sponge and the reef tank needs a green sponge so you never take the quarantine sponge that may have ick on it and go clean your reef and mess up you know so keep that in mind too thank you very much Heron for mentioning that uh, Benjamin says is your NASA tank the normal NASA or the blonde NASA it's hard to tell with the, diff the difference because of the blue light. So Spock, I always thought was a blonde Nasso. Turns out I'm wrong. <laughs> the blonde Nasso has a yellow streak on the top and mine does not. 
So she would be Nasso literatus, like you said, and not the Nasso elegans. Uh, Hillbilly Reefer says, I've been told that scraping hydroids off my rock may adversely affect my fish. Any thoughts on this? Well, I mean, you know, when we scrape anything off and it goes in the water column and blows around, it has the potential to do something. And so if you were scraping off hydroids, like literally scraping and letting them fly off in the flow, yeah, they could sting things that they touch. They could sting corals, they could sting fish, they could mm, sting some kind of vertebrate. Uh, for me, when I had hydroids, uh, I peeled them off. You know, I, I ripped them off. And then, you know, I might scrape off the, you know, the tubes at the bottom. But uh, I'm not a fan of brushing. I never have been. I always felt like you're just spreading the problem elsewhere. I also, whenever I'm dealing with a potential problem in the tank, I like to stop all the flow in the tank and work in that area. And whatever I'm doing will just fall to the bottom like gravity. I can just bring it together as a pile, and I can siphon it out and then resume flow. So you might consider that when you're working in your tank. But I, I mean, I don't know that it's going to hurt your fish, but is there a possibility? Yeah, I guess it's potentially possible. Uh, Scratchy Chan, I think I answered this during the stream. He uh, said, what about a tank that has ick and everyone recovers from it and it seems to show no signs of ick? Is it still in the system? Probably still is. It could be that the fish have built up enough of an immunity to where it's not present, but then when you add that new fish that you buy, it suddenly shows up. And it could show up on not just the new fish, it could show up on all the fish. And I would think part of the reason, this is just me guessing, is that the new fish is a stressor, the stress hormone I talked about, and it gets released into the column, and all the fish are agitated, and then all, they're all stressed. And so you, suddenly you see ick is present. So, you know, it it is possible to eliminate it, but you'd have to do all the stuff I mentioned in the beginning. You know, where you have to remove all the fish and go fishless for a long duration and treat all your fish you own to get them ick free and then reintroduce them in their tank. And now you know your tank is ick free. And I've got a friend, uh, the one I went to visit in Pennsylvania, his name's Jerry. He always had battle ick. It was an ongoing thing. And then finally one day he was just fed up. And he even, we did a stream together he, um, here in the living room. And, uh, he talked about his experience, and if I remember correctly, the biggest thing he did was he just took every tank, broke it down, like everything he owned, cleaned it with bleach water, and started them all fresh. And uh, somehow he finally got ick out of his system. And he's got the same, he's had the same fish now for many years, and not a sign of ick. It's like, this is how I finally got rid of it. And I remember it was basically restarting the tanks after a thorough, thorough cleaning. Um, Josh says, what organics in the water could cause the skimmer to rise on the water level and skim poorly? Uh, well, you know what? A lot of times our foods affect the protein skimmer temporarily. Uh, foods like P.E. mysis are very oily, so anything with oil could affect your skimmer. Um, you're talk I feel what you're saying is that your bubbles are collapsing rather than foaming over and making the skimmer overflow because you said... It causes the water level to rise, but skim poorly. So I'm thinking of less bubbles. So there's something in the water column that's affecting it. A lot of times the things we put in makes the skimmer kind of turn into a little volcano and overflows and makes a giant mess and we can't seem to control the skimmer. But uh, I would look at things that are making it collapse, which could probably be your food. It could be food in the auto feeder. It could be the frozen food. It could be the flake food, pellet food, uh, some kind of a food that sticks to the glass like mastic. Um, also, there's other products out there that can affect a protein skimmer. And then, of course, barometric pressure is the number one uh, cancellation of all protein skimmers. When weather happens outside, your skimmer will be affected. So even though you keep the doors and windows closed, there's a lightning storm outside, your protein skimmer can overflow. And you're like, what happened? I hadn't touched anything. I didn't do anything. It's the barometric pressure literally affecting your home. Just like, you know, stuff happens outside and you feel it in your eardrums. It's the same principle. So, uh... I would keep that in mind, and uh, you know, I don't know how long ago you cleaned your Deltec, but it may be time for a really good cleaning. Especially check the inlet where the uh, Venturi is, that spot where the tubing goes into the nipple. Remove the tubing, look inside the nipple, possibly take a exact diameter match drill bit and put it in the nipple and just hand twist it to carve out any salt creep and make sure it's see-through. So make sure you can just see right through it, air can go through it, put the tube back on, get the skimmer going again. It could be something as simple as some little obstruction that has caused your bubbles to collapse and not doing 
not do what it's doing. Or someone twisted some little knob that, uh, like, because a lot of protein skimmers these days always have the ability to dial down the air. And I'm like, why would you ever do that? <laughs> I remember years ago, people were obsessed with how much air can I get into my skimmer? I want more air, more air. And they got these meters to measure how much air per liter was going through. And this little ball bearing, or not ball bearing, but this little bead would bounce up to a certain level. And they wanted it super crazy high. So, um, you know, me, I, I don't care what the number is. I just want my valve wide open. I don't dial down the air. I have the air as much as it can get. And I make sure the intake of the pumps that suck the water in are unobstructed. I like to take them apart and clean the impellers from time to time. And I always look at that nipple I was talking about where there's a possibility that a salt, and I say salt creep, but it really becomes like a salt stone. You carve that out so that it's just pure air passing through. It's very important. Also, other things could be in your house that are affecting it. Aerosols, uh, vaping, smokers, <laughs> that can affect it too, believe it or not. And uh, any kind of like a potpourri type oil that you heat up on a candle, you know, to make a nice smell. These things can actually affect it. I know there was this one guy with a reef tank had problems with his aquarium and his skimmer. And it was in the master bedroom and where his wife did all her makeup and did all her hairspray and all that kind of stuff. And when he got her to quit using those temporarily or go to a different bathroom, the whole tank did better. And so he learned, okay, whatever she's doing, that door needs to be closed or she can't spray that hairspray or whatever it was. He figured it out. But we did identify it was environmentally affecting his aquarium. Michael B. says, thanks for getting the MP40 out to me so fast. You're very welcome. I need to get another one in stock. Um, Justin says, I have three anemones. One is a rose bubble tip, one's a green bubble tip, and one's a ritter eye. The ritter eye is in my display, and the other two are in a 40 breeder, but I can't seem to keep them flourishing. I use the uh, Reef Trace app and log my parameters. Um, and then he says, I mainly feed them and have 140. Oh, that par is really low. That's really, really low. 140 par is super low. You're going to want more. <laughs> uh, lower the light, increase intensity. Uh, but 140 is super low. That's barely enough. That could be part of your problem. Now, you mentioned they're in separate tanks, but you didn't say they're in the same sump, like it's all shared water like mine. But um, increased par, good flow, those are important. You can feed them a little bit. But if they are sharing the same water column through a common sump, it could be a ritter eye is chemically disagreeing with the bubble tips because ideally you want all one flavor, now, you know, one species of anemones in your system. I kind of got away with the sea bay in here and all the bubble tips in the cube. Just got lucky. But when I had them all together in one cube, the sea bay was shrinking away. It was going to die. <laughs> I see. Yeah, she says, sorry to make you do math on the weekend. Um... Trent says, did you get around to buying the PAR meter? No, but it's on my list. I'm going to buy it. I promise. I want to do it because I, I really want to know what the status of these bulbs are now because I want to change them, but I want to measure them before I remove them. And so I want to measure, get the, meeting, the readings, and then put the new ones in, wait a few days, get fresh readings, and do a verification or a comparison. I mean, for all I know, my bulbs might be 15% weaker than what they were originally, which is a, a good amount. Andrew is here from England, and he says he has a yellow tank that has developed some brown blotches. Do I have any ideas? Yes. Go to humble.fish and hit enter. <laughs> Go in your browser, type humble.fish, enter. Just hit it. There's no .com or .net or .tv. It's just humble.fish. Go there and see what he says. He has a forum on his website. He has articles on his website you can read, and hopefully you'll find an answer. Um, Arlo says, how many gallons per hour flow do you recommend for a fish-only tank that's got, that I just got? It's 11 feet long? Holy cow! Wow! That's amazing. I don't know. A lot. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't know. 5,000 gallons an hour? I don't know. Huge! I'm just trying to think what kind of pump I would use on that, you know? Minimum 2,000 gallons an hour, for sure. But you could probably go up to five because it's such a long tank. Uh, congrats. Wow. 11 feet. Minus seven. 
Wow. What fish did you get? That's amazing. Uh, Trent says, I picked up four leather corals and I dipped and put them in the tank. Should I run carbon while the leather settle? I don't think you need to unless this is a very small tank and these are very large leathers. But as the leathers get bigger, carbon is going to be more and more important for your aquarium. James says, I don't know if you have the new G, uh, G5 radions, the Gen 5 radions, but I want to put one over my 40-gallon cube tank. Which radion should I use, the Pro or the Blue? I want to do an anemone tank like yours. I would get the Pro. That would be my recommendation. The, I just feel like the Pro gives you some daylight to where you can have the nice white light through part of the day, and then you can switch into the blue hues. If you get the blue, you're going to be in blue forever. You'll never get to get any daylight, and uh, that's why I recommend the Pro. Now, I have not got to play with both, and, you know, I've watched some videos, you know, I've talked to Ecotech, but uh, I really like the Pro. And the, the 2,000 gallon aquarium I was telling you about, we just got him all the Pros, Gen 5 Pros. So uh, I would recommend that, because so, it gives you the flexibility of daytime, as well as the cool evening dusk, and then the crazy blue for, you know, the midnight hours, you know what I mean. But that would be my recommendation. Uh, scratchy Chan says, did you get a new camera? I can see your tank a lot better. You know, the tank never looks good in these streams. As I back up and now the lens focuses on me, the tank gets a little bit more in focus. But webcams do no justice for reef tanks at all. That's why I try to release videos. Matter of fact, I should have done that before. We'll just grab this footage from August. Turn my microphone back on. <laughs> And let's see if I can figure out my picture-in-picture -picture thing again. So I'll swap it. There we go. So now you can actually see the reef tank. Um, this was shot last month. It hasn't changed much. Uh, matter of fact, something I can tell you guys. Uh, I'll put myself here. Um, I've seen a lot of nice new growth on the acros. Man, it's just it's so exciting. It's super healthy. I did buy something recently. I bought an arrow crab at uh, Petco. I was there, and I went back two days later and bought it. <laughs> um, and uh, I put it. You know, I went through acclimation. I put it in the tank. It did really good for two days, and then the third day, I saw two snails eating it. I have no idea why it died. None whatsoever. It makes no sense. It looked very healthy. Um, it's gone. So <laughs> I guess I won't have an arrow crab in my reef at this time. That was kind of a bummer. Ed says, can we talk about Montipore eating nudibranch? I already did a live stream on that. You'll find that here on this channel. So you can check that out. Uh, Sean says, any recommendations on how to remove palithoa safely that are spreading my reef tank? Stop the flow, wear gloves, wear eye protection, peel them off, put them in a bag, throw them in the trash. Wash your hands, wash your face, <laughs> um, run some carbon. Um, that's about it. Don't lick them. Don't scratch your face. Don't put your fingers in your mouth. Uh, that's it. Do not use brushes. Don't use pressure washing. Don't submerge them in acid. You know, don't do all the crazy over-the-top stuff. Don't get a propane torch and try to burn them off the rock. Um, all that stuff aerosolizes it, which is the thing we're trying to avoid. Tam says, skimmer vibrations are driving me nuts. I disassembled and cleaned it, and there's no change. Does noise and vibrations bother fish? Does baiting shutting it off? Well, we don't want to shut off your skimmer. So you didn't say what kind of skimmer it was. Like, is it in a sump? Is it hanging on the tank? But you can get anti-vibration pads that you can put under the skimmer to stop that. You can put it under the pump if that's where it's in. you got to find what is making the sound and then solve it. You can isolate it, and then you will have a nice quiet tank again. But I would look into that. I would not turn off the protein skimmer. The protein skimmer, to me, is super important to aquarium. Not only does it remove waste, it is actually driving off CO2 from the aquarium, which keeps the oxygen levels up. It does not add air, which I always thought it did. No, it, it drives off the CO2 so that the, the oxygen is present. Because the more CO2 in your tank, the lower the pH. Oh, man. Tim says, do you, have a partic do you know of a particular place to get Bergia nudibranchs? I don't, um, and I haven't. But there's a few other people that have. Uh, Reef Dudes just did a video about them maybe two and a half months ago, and he did some really cool time lapse of them devouring Aptasia. Uh, I would ask him where he got his. I know he's in Canada, but you know he might know the source off the top of his head. 
I have not tried to get them. I, from time to time, I kind of want to just for fun, but I haven't done it. So I, I don't have any advice. Uh, Tim says, I have an Aptasia explosion. I did the same thing. Uh, same guy. <laughs> I had an Aptasia explosion in my 50-gallon cube tank since the peppermint shrimp died. I'm thinking about taking the copper band from the larger tank to work on them for a while. Uh, do you advise this? Yeah, why not? Sure. I think it's a great idea. And Joe just said he's watching the stream while he's performing a water change at the same time. The Kenya tree looks majorly stressed. That's okay. Those things are super hardy. And nitrate was at 20. Good. I haven't tested my water yet. I definitely need to do that. And then Paul uh, gave me a super chat. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. And he says, try the Senai as a PAR meter because it works. I would, uh, well, I basically want to get the new PAR meter from Apogee. I've had their last two meters. I want to get their latest one. The latest one is designed for LEDs as well as metal halides. So it lets me handle both tanks. So that is my plan. And I got to the end of the chat in an hour and a half. That's a miracle. You guys are being less chatty. D says that you can get the Bergy and Nudibranchs from Salty Underground. Thank you very much, D. I appreciate that. Um, and then Trent says, I want to thank you. Uh, your tank and your streams are what got me reefing. I'm probably a little obsessed with my glass box. So aren't we all? Don't we all just love our reef tanks? So, uh, you know, that's, that's what we do. So you know what? I think I'm going to wrap this up early so I can get some more things done today. Um, today is water test Saturday. I hope you have been good the last couple Saturdays and not slacking off since I wasn't here to remind you. We test our water every Saturday. We want to make sure that all our parameters are good, that all the, the corals and fish can remain healthy. So you use all your test kits like you're supposed to. Don't be lazy. And uh, I also always recommend that you clean your protein skimmer's cup and the neck to make sure that it's skimming efficiently. And uh, since so many of you do dosing, I always recommend you test your dosers with a little feed button to make sure liquid is coming out, that the tubing doesn't need to be, you know, like crunched between your fingers to break up any coagulation. <laughs> That's probably the wrong term, but it does. It solidifies and then nothing comes out and you're no longer dosing. Also, a quick uh, life hack I've reminded you guys about several times. If you're dosing into an area of your sump or even an area of your tank where the flow is not good, your, all the stuff just congeals as it goes to the bottom. It does not mix into the water column like you would think. And so you keep adding more and more of the product because the numbers aren't coming up. It's smart. It's very smart to put a little tiny power head underneath the area pointing straight up where the dosers are dripping in. So as it hits the water, it mixes and sends it off into the system. And if you put that little tiny power head under that area and just plug it in, it uses like, what, three watts of power and just leave it running 24-7. It'll be there anytime your doser turns on, day or night and constantly help mix it into the system. And you'll dose less product into your tank, which means the additives will last longer. So be sure you're doing that. Ah, Kevin says, if you're a local person to Dallas-Fort Worth, oh, I do have one more piece of news. <laughs> uh, if you're local, you can get them from Robert's Reef, which is one of our local fish stores. I'm wearing the Macna shirt for next year's Macna. And the reason I got it was because of the whale shark. I was like, whale shark sold. So I have yet another Macna shirt. And then I do have this one more newsy thing to tell you guys, you know, because my life is never the same. I'm never stagnant. I'm like a shark, always on the move. I am the president of DFW Mass again. So now I am working with the new board of directors. We're going to be working on a virtual uh, set of meetings this year because of COVID. But uh, I used to be the club uh, president for something like six years, a long time ago. And uh, I stepped up and said, I'll do it again because I, I wanted to help the club. So... Not only are you talking to a YouTuber and a guy that sells aquarium supplies, I'm running a club again. So, and you know, it's, it's a group thing, but someone had to be in charge. So I said, I'll do it. So I'm doing it. Let's see. Um, <laughs> Paul says, any tips on reducing nitrate? <laughs> Have you been following my channel for like the last few years? Um, the biggest solution is a ginormous water change. 50% water change will cut your nitrates in half. And I talked about that not too long ago. All right. Oh, well, I have to do this. Thank you very much, Malcolm, for the super chat. I appreciate it. I'm going to say goodbye. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Do all the things we talked about. Don't get ick into your tank. And if you have it, solve it so that all your new fish are nice and healthy. And uh, good luck with your tanks. And if you have questions or anything, you can reach out to me. Once this video gets on YouTube, I will put in all the links in the video's description so that you can uh, chase down the factoids 
and get some more knowledge in your heads. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in a week. Bye.